Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, we will continue to prove uh, other Silo's theorems. So, let us uh, recall what we proved so far. So, we proved the first Silo's theorem which actually guarantees that Silo P subgroups exist. So, let us start with uh, G being a group and then let us say G has uh, uh, cardinality of G is exactly some P power k times m where m and m are m and p are relatively prime okay this is the data given so where p is a prime number okay so you fix a prime number p and then you write uh, cardinality of g equal to p power k times m where m and p are relatively prime that means p power k is the largest power of p that actually divides this cardinality of g so, then uh, what we proved? So, this is the statement of uh, Silo's first theorem. So, which says Silo P subgroup actually exists. That means there exists H subgroup of G, okay, such that order of H equal to P power K. So, any subgroup of order P power K is called silo P subgroup. Okay. So, H is called a silo P subgroup. So, note that we can actually denote uh, this uh, capital S I L O of P to be set of all silo P subgroups. Okay. The set of all silo p subgroups of g okay then we just simply proved this is actually non empty set so since g is a finite group uh, there are only finitely many subgroups of g so this silo p g that is actually a finite set okay so we are interested in understanding okay so what is the cardinality of this set and uh, any other relationship are there between the elements of this set. Okay? So, that is what uh, guaranteed in the second and third Silo's theorems. Okay? The second Silo's theorem says uh, there are some relationship between any two given Silo groups. So, let me state the second theorem, Silo's second theorem. So, which assess something. So, if we take two silo P subgroups, so then we can prove that they are conjugate inside the group G. That means, there exist G in G such that H is conjugate to this K. So, G H G inverse equal to K. So, they are conjugate under this inner atom of sum defined by this G. So, uh, now this says that up to this conjugacy relation you can actually define the action of this G on this uh, set of all silo uh, P subgroups. Okay. So, then uh, this uh, second theorem can be rephrased as the group G acts as actually acts transitively on the set of all silo P subgroups. Okay? So, in other words, you have the action. So, G acts on the silo P subgroups via conjugation okay? and this action is transitive. So, this action is transitive. So, that is the meaning of the second statement. So, note that uh, if you take any H which has order P power K, then if you take any conjugate of that, that will have order P power K. So, that way you always have this action of G on the set of all silo P subgroups. So, that is not a problem. The important part of the statement is this action is transitive action. Okay, so, let us try to understand uh, uh, this uh, result. 
okay uh, so if we think about it okay so we want to actually uh, prove that uh, okay given two uh, silo piece of groups they are conjugate okay so how do we proceed this so we can fix uh, this uh, uh, subgroups okay so here is the proof so you can fix these subgroups of g such that both of them are actually silo piece of groups that means both of them have cardinal t p power k so then what you can do you can make k act on this g modulo h via conjugation okay so this is uh, indeed okay so this is not via conjugation this is just by multiplication so you can take uh, the left multiplication action of g on g mod h then you can restrict that action uh, to k so that is the action that uh, we are talking about so k acts on g mod h via this uh, small k dot a h is given by k a h okay so this is the action that we are talking about but note that uh, k is actually silo p subgroup in particularly the order is p power k so in particular it is a p group so k is a p group okay that means it has order which is power of prime so if you take x to be this uh, g mod h then using the result that we proved uh, for the action of p groups we can immediately have so if you write that uh, class equation or that uh, orbit decomposition of this uh, yeah, x okay then we saw that the cardinality of x is going to be congruent to cardinality of x power k because k is the group that is acting modulo the prime p so this is actually something we have already proved for p group if a p group acts on uh, some set capital x then the cardinality of x is congruent to the cardinality of the fixed points of that x under the group action modulo the prime p okay so that is what uh, we have in already so now note that what will be the cardinality of x in this case the cardinality of x is nothing but the cardinality of g modulo h the cardinality of g modulo h if you just work it out it is just cardinality of g divided by cardinality of h which is exactly equal to m because cardinality of g is p power k m divided by p power k is going to be m but m is not divisible by p so note that so the m and p they are relatively prime that means what that means the cardinality of x power k will be never zero modulo p okay that implies cardinality of x power k is at least one that's all we need okay so this is guaranteed by telling that p doesn't divide the cardinality of x and cardinality of x is congruent to cardinality of x power k so that immediately implies at least cardinality of x power k is non zero okay so that means what that mean there exist some coset ah inside this x power k so if you translate this okay this means this k acts trivially on this coset for all k in capital k okay so let let's rewrite this so you can rewrite this as follows a inverse k a h equal to h for all k in capital k so you have this fixed a okay for for which you can see that a inverse k a h is h for all k in k but h is a subgroup so that means what that means this implies a inverse k a is an element of h for all k in capital k so 
what is the meaning of this this means if you take the conjugate of capital k under this uh, a so then this is going to be subset of h so that's all it means okay the conjugate of this capital k under this a inverse is going to be subset of h but note that the cardinality of h is p power k and the cardinality of k is p power k so in particularly the conjugate of k that is also has cardinality p power k so since it is a subset of h which has cardinality exactly cardinality of h that forces that it is exactly equal to h okay so h is equal to a inverse k a but that means what k is equal to a h a inverse if we go back we started with two arbitrary silo piece of groups we made one group to act on uh, this cosets of another group and we got the fixed point and that uh, tells us that so these two groups must be actually conjugate to each other so this proves all silo piece of groups are conjugate okay so let's try to understand this more closely so if you take uh, the silo uh p subgroups the set set okay so then we can easily see that if i make this g act on this okay so so you can make g acts on this this thing okay via this conjugation so g dot some group is nothing but g h g inverse okay this is an action so that uh, now because any two silo groups are subgroups are conjugate so this says that this action is actually transitive action so this action is indeed transitive action but we know something about the transitive action the transitive action is isomorphic to the following action for example you can fix some particular element of that set okay if you fix some h inside if you fix some x inside the silo of p g then if you look at the fixed points of this okay so what it will be or you can actually look at this uh, the subgroup of g that fixes h okay so let's look at this subgroup of the or the stabilizer of h okay inside g so this i am treating as it as element so your set is this okay this is your set and this is element and i am looking at the stabilizer of that stabilizer of that element in g okay so if you look at it what it is it is those g in g such that g dot h should be h that means g h g inverse equal to h but what it is it is nothing but the normalizer of h in g okay so then we have already shown that okay this g modulo g h has one to one correspondence between there is a bijective correspondence not only bijective correspondence it is actually Uh, g sets isomorphism so g naturally acts on the left side on g modulo g h okay so you have this uh, g sets isomorphism between this g mod g h and this uh, silo this uh, set silo p subgroups so that means the cardinality of this uh, silo p subgroups is exactly the cardinality of uh, g modulo the cardinality of g h which is exactly the cardinality of g divided by the cardinality of the normalizer okay so what is our intake from this so this is index of some subgroup of g okay but any index of the group subgroup also divides the cardinality of the original group okay so since cardinality of g equal to cardinality of g divided by the cardinality of ng of h 
times the cardinality of ng of h. So, we can conclude that we can conclude that the cardinality of the silo p subgroups divides the cardinality of g. Okay, it is a very very important conclusion. So, let us denote uh, n p of g by this cardinality. Okay. So, right now already we have some understanding of this number. So, this number actually divides the cardinality of g and not only that this number is exactly equal to the index of the normalizer of some uh, silo p subgroup of g. Okay. So, you can fix any silo p subgroup then you look at the normalizer of that and then take the index of that normalizer inside g that is going to be exactly equal to the cardinality of this uh, silo p g. Okay, so, now uh, look let us look at this third theorem of silos. So, that actually tells what other properties uh, this n p of g has. Okay. So, here is our third theorem. So, let me write it down. So, this asserts that the number of okay, this is exactly the number of distinct silo p subgroups of G. So, this number n p of G is exactly congruent to 1 modulo p. Okay. So, that is what it says. So, when you take uh, this uh, number n p of g congruent to 1, uh, it is exactly congruent to 1 modulo p. So, how do we actually prove this? So, let us see. So, note that already we know that n p of g divides the cardinality of g which is exactly p power k times m. And using this third theorem, Okay, this is the statement of third theorem. You can easily see that okay, as a corollary p does not divide n p of g. So, that means they are relatively prime n p of g and p are relatively prime. Okay. If this is actually relatively prime, so then you can see that uh, so, this has to actually divide only okay. So, if you take uh, some uh, if you take the prime factorization of this n p of g. So, then the any prime uh, p power okay should not appear in this n p of g. So, what we actually what we can conclude from this we can conclude that if we take prime factorization of n p of g. So, then power of okay, this particular prime p okay, cannot appear in that n p of g. Okay. So, because n p of g does not have any particular uh, yeah p does not divide n p of g. So, that means, uh, in case if you are in if you are actually factorizing okay, p power k m equal to n p of g times some d. Okay. Then what you can see, you can see that uh, there is a close relationship between this n p of g and m. Namely, this n p of g must divide m. Okay, so this n p of g must divide. M. So this is just you can you can write down the prime factorization. 
and then look at it ok. So, if you take the prime factorization of m uh, you can see that. So, except this particular prime p power k all other uh, prime factoriza uh, factorization of this cardinality of g must appear in m ok. So, let us let us write it. So, let us say cardinality of g equal to some p 1 power alpha 1, p 2 power alpha 2 etcetera p r power alpha r where p 1 let us say p ok and alpha 1 let us say k. So, that means the cardinality of g equal to this p 1 power alpha 1 times m. So, m will be exactly p 2 power alpha 2 etcetera p r power alpha r. So, now you have written this exactly equal to n p of g times d ok and note that no prime factorization of uh, ok. So, this p 1 does not appear in the prime factorization of this n p g. So, p 1 does not appear in the prime factorization of n p g. So, that means, so whatever primes that are appearing in n p g they have to come from this ok and all the exponents are here for these primes. So, so these exponents if p i some r i divides this n p of g then this r i has to be less than or equal to alpha i i greater than or equal to 2 ok. So, that tells you that this n p of g must divide m and not only this this n p of g must be concurrent to 1 modulo p that is also there. So, let us see how one can prove this ok. Now, again what we do we fix one silo p subgroup fix h to be 1 silo p subgroup of g and then make h 2 act on this set silo p g again via conjugation ok. So, we just take uh, uh, this h and then uh, ok make it act on this uh, set silo p g. So, this is the set now and this is the group now. So, if you are not comfortable which one is set which one is group you, you always mention it and then you keep track of all those things ok. So, now uh, again what is the cardinality of h cardinality of h is p power k in particular it is a p group. So, that means if you call this is capital Y then the cardinality of y is congruent to cardinality of y power h modulo p again from our previous result ok. So, that means uh, this uh, this cardinality of uh, this y power h ok. So, that is going to be uh, congruent to the cardinality of y. So, in case if we prove that this cardinality of y power h is 1, so then we are done ok because what is the cardinality of y? So, the cardinality of y is the cardinality of this silo p g, so which is exactly n p g ok. So, now we have n p g congruent to the cardinality of y power h modulo p. So, let us look at this y power h. So, what is y power h? This is going to be those subgroups silo p subgroups k in silo p g such that it is fixed by the action of h. That means, if I take g k g inverse that is going to be equal to k for all g in h ok. So, that is your y power h. So, note that already h is there inside this y power h. So, it is actually non-empty 
because this equation is satisfied by h g h g inverse is going to be h for all g in h because h is a subgroup okay so this is already there so now what we do we take another k from this y h and see what happens if you take another k then what will happen then this satisfy g k g inverse equal to k for all g in h so that means what that means if you look at the normalizer of this k that contains h so that is the meaning of this so these two are equivalent okay the normalizer of h, uh, k contains h so that means if i compute this h k you can see that this is going to be union g k g in h but uh, here you can see that g k is same as k g so this is union k g g in h so that is exactly equal to k h so this just simply says h k is equal to k h this is something we have already seen i am just rewriting so now using our criterion for uh, when the h k being subgroup you can easily see that in this case h k becomes subgroup so h k is indeed subgroup of g but what kind of subgroup is it okay let's look at the order of this h k the order of h k we already know that it is going to be order of h times order of k divided by order of h intersection k but what is order of h order of h is p power k and order of k is p power k so then that is going to give us p power 2k divided by order of h intersection k but this is going to be a subgroup okay this order of h k must divide p power k m because h k is a subgroup of g that imply the order of h k should divide order of g what it is it is p power k times m and m and p are relatively prime so it says that p power k is the largest power of that p prime p such that p power k divides r of g so that means if you take this particular thing okay because h and k both are p groups both having cardinality p power k p power k and h intersection k is a subgroup of h as well as k so it has to be some the cardinality of h intersection k also should be some power of the prime okay prime p so then if you put it together you can see that the the h intersection k if you write this as p power some alpha alpha let's say greater than or equal to 0 okay we don't know what it is then you can see that p power 2k minus alpha divides the cardinality of g which is p power k times m but k is the largest power okay that means this 2 power k minus alpha should be less than or equal to k there is no other option so that will imply that k is less than or equal to alpha okay but alpha is natural number so it's actually non -pos it's positive number non negative number so but we are saying that it is at least k but uh, h intersection k is a subgroup of h that forces that it is at most k so that means we indeed proved k equal to alpha okay but when this k can be alpha h intersection k if it is p power k that means h intersection k is exactly h as well as k so this is the only time it can happen but that means what that means we have proved that if you take any k in y power h then that k must be h okay that means the cardinality of y power h okay this this implies the cardinality of y power h is 1 okay so now this proves that this np g is congruent to 1 modulo prime p okay so this actually completes the proof 
okay so there are some important things to note if you denote npg by the cardinality of the number of the cardinality of silo p g which is number of silo p subgroups of g then we have immediately np of g divides this cardinality of g divided by the p power k and np of g is congruent to 1 modulo p so these two things are there so this actually puts lots of restriction on np of g okay in many small orders we will be able to determine explicitly what it is what possibilities that can have so that will actually going to tell lot about the group okay so in in my next lecture i will actually explain that uh, with uh, more examples okay so that means we can have many many interesting applications of silos theorem because silos theorem very very rigidly says lots of constraints are there even for the silo p subgroups not only the existential it also says silo p subgroups okay they are not something random they have to have very specific properties okay i will stop here uh, we will continue in the next class with some applications of uh, uh, silo theorems okay thank you